recording. Let's see. Oh, people are starting to come in. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes once we see that everyone or mostly everyone uh, has uh, joined us. Mm -hmm. But we're going to chat a little bit so that you we know that you can hear us. Yep. And also you could see us. Yep. <clears throat> For those of you that are joining us, I just want to say that um, Andrea Lewandowski and Bob Keith are here today. Uh, they're going to be in the background helping with the Zoom. Uh, and so any technical issues you have, please put them in the chat box. Uh, the Q&A is going to be reserved for your questions. So know that Bob and Andrea are always going to be there in the background in case you're having any problems. And they're also going to be coordinating the questions for a little while, um, for the end of the last 15 minutes of the program. And I'll repeat that in a second as soon as we see a number of people have joined us. I fixed my Zoom background, so it's all nice and plain looking. Yep, we got lots of people saying hello in the chat. Hello to everyone. Trying to, Hi, everyone. I'm going to try to keep up with it once um, everybody starts talking and I... Uh, uh, so I'll go over this again. Bob wow. Keith and Andrea Lewandowski are here. Luis, um, Bob is in the State Library. Oh, Bob That's is yeah, in the This is the grid, renovated uh, State Library behind door. me. It uh, goes to infinity. Um, yes. So... Uh, They'll be helping you with any technical issues that you have, and they'll also mm -hmm. be monitoring questions. So please put your technical issues in the chat and put your questions in Q&A for the last 15 minutes of the program. Uh, the way it's going to work is this. We're going to have Mary talk for a while and uh, for about 15, 20 minutes. We're then going to have Eric Kleinenberg come in and talk about uh, palaces for the people. We'll then have Mary and Eric do their fireside chat where they can pretend they're by a fire and uh, do their chat for around 15 or 20 minutes. And then the last 15 minutes are gonna be reserved for your questions. Bob and Andrea will be handling the questions. I'm just here to get everybody started up and also to uh, maybe cut in at the towards the end so that we give you time um, to ask whatever it is that you want to ask from Eric. So how's it look in there, Bob? Oh, it's looking good. We got um, probably uh, you know let's let's give it two more minutes to start at two o five, and um, you know we'll bring Mary in for her remarks then. Um, oh, hi, James. James is on. Nice, yep. nice James to. Monaghan. Hear from you or see you in the chat. Yeah. And um, hi, Juliet. I feel like one of those people that sells the stuff online, you know, <laughs> <laughs> selling the leggings or the blankets or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Yeah. More people coming in, so that's good. So Nancy um, from ILS, great, terrific. Michelle, did you mention that we're recording this? We are recording this. Yeah, so yeah, we're recording this. We'll try to put it out on the State Library YouTube page um, as soon as possible after this. Um, and uh, yeah. We, we have people, sure. we have Karen from Rhode Island and Robin from Missouri. So we're really getting uh, people from all over the place today. Welcome. So glad you can make it for Mary's last webinar. I know she's thrilled. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I think we should, uh, uh, Andrea and I should turn off our mics and cameras as my dogs start to explode out in the other room um, and, uh, and leave it to Michelle Hi, to Leah. introduce Mary. We all set? Okay, 
So my name is Michelle Stricker and I am the Deputy State Librarian for Lifelong Learning at the New Jersey State Library. And I wanna just sort of explain the breakout today, the way this will work a little bit uh, before I introduce Mary or she needs no introduction before I bring her out. So Mary will come on first and she's gonna be giving you just some reflections on, you know, meaningful events in her career. She didn't share with me what she wanted to say, but she's gonna just talk about her career, not just in New Jersey, but you know, back from IMLS and when she was also a librarian and a state librarian in Delaware. And then after that, Eric Kleinenberg is gonna come on and he's gonna speak about his book. He will be joined when he's finished by Mary for their chat for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then after that, there's going to be time for questions uh, from you, from the attendees. So please be sure that you put all of your questions in the Q&A. And if you have any technical issues, Bob and Andrea will help you, but you need to put that in the chat. So chat for technical and Q&A for your questions that Bob and Andrea will go over at towards the end of the program. So before I get started with Mary, I want to tell you that we have um, a number of Eric Klenenberg's books, Palaces for the People, and I'm not quite sure how many we have left, but when I get into the building at the State Library, I'm going to count those up, and we are going to send those out to the first number of people who registered for the webinar. So at some point, if you were within the first 15 or 20 or however many books we have left, uh, you will be getting a copy of Eric's book. So that's great. And uh, so now before I turn it over to Mary, I just wanted to highlight several of her most significant achievements as the New Jersey State Library librarian over the past eight and a half years. Mary has led the New Jersey State Library in the launch of several innovative projects that help New Jersey libraries serve as national models for delivering services to all people in the state, such as the Career Online High School Partnership with the New Jersey Office of Workforce Development, the Fresh Start Initiative, and a program that provided makerspace startup grants. Mary's primary focus areas have been promoting equity of access and developing collaborative alliances in critical areas of library services. And under her leadership efforts, uh, it has included workforce development, cultural competencies and literacy training for library staff, preservation and digitization, and disaster preparedness and recovery, which led to the founding of the New Jersey uh, Cultural Alliance for Response. She championed the successful expansion of an agency-wide focus on partnership and collaboration. These efforts have been both, both internally and externally focused and have ranged from in-house interdepartmental efforts to collaborative efforts with other New Jersey state offices and even to multi-state efforts such as the Multi-State Futures Conference and the formation of a Digital Public Library of America Hub, DPLA, in partnership with the state of Delaware. So Mary, on behalf of the New Jersey Library staff, um, let me extend all of our best wishes for a happy retirement. And now I'm going to turn it over to you, Mary, to take over now. Thank you, Michelle. Um, that was very gracious, very nice. Um, everybody knows it's a little bittersweet for me. However, before I start talking all about me, um, we have a special guest with us for the beginning of today's program. And um, this must be the day that uh, exiting state librarians get honored because Jennifer Nelson is has another event she needs to join um, in Minnesota. Um, so she only can give us about five minutes here at the beginning, but I want to make sure that Jennifer has a chance to say hello and you all have a chance to see Jennifer so that she will feel like she is joining the New Jersey community already partially introduced. Um, so Jennifer, thanks for joining us. 
Thank you, Mary. I so appreciate the invitation. And I um, am looking forward to building on the foundations that you've built in New Jersey. As I listened to Michelle, I thought, wow, I got something to live up to here. And I'm really looking <laughs> forward to the challenge. And I want to thank you um, for your support in this transition area. It's been wonderful. So um, everyone that's out there, I have an email address at the New Jersey State Library now. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. I might be a little slow responding until I'm officially on the job on February 2nd, but I'd um, love to hear from you and um, look forward to working with you over the next however many years. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jen. And, and have fun at your uh, event um, in your current home. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jen has already has already come up, has found a place to live, um, is um, really in good order. And we won't tell the folks in Minnesota, but after she went back, um, after her brief visit, she said, gosh, I was so enthused getting up there. I want to get done with all of this here and then come up and be in New Jersey. So we'll be thrilled to have her. So I've been doing some reflecting. Michelle made me do it. Um, thinking about and getting ready to answer her questions with regards to, oh, what have been your, what have been your themes? What do you think has been your focus? Well, I wish I could say that I had planned all of that, but I did stop and spend a little bit of time thinking about what had been some ongoing themes, not just in New Jersey. Um, New Jersey, as we all know, is unique, but there have been other things that I think have, have played out on a smaller stage, or maybe on supposedly a bigger stage, but maybe um, a little less brilliantly. And when I thought back on what might be, say, four words that I would, I would go back and want to hang some events, some accomplishments on, it would be planning, which in my personal life, I don't necessarily do that well, but I did become a real um, advocate for strategic planning in libraries. And that, that goes back to um, my first full-time public library job, a library I was in for 11 years. The first four, I didn't have my library degree yet, but um, we learned the power of strategic planning because we went through the strategic planning process after our budget, it was already on the stage, but after our budget had been cut by 47%, and our hours had been reduced and everything else. But we proceeded to go through our planning. I had a lucky 13 people on my um, planning committee, including the town clerk, and um, numerous, numerous voices were heard. And when we were done, we submitted it to the town council, and they um, informed us that they just had to pay out money for the police to do their strategic plan, and we had done ours. And when I left that library, four years later, the budget that I left behind was four times what I had inherited with that big cut. Building alliances. Um, alliances and collaboration are something that I just believe in, in especially in, in this world, for all sorts of reasons. You can't, you can't provide services to people if you don't know what they want. You can't just do good for them. Um, you need to involve them in it. And sometimes it's not just going directly to the, to the um, desired candidate for your service. It's working with others who also serve that same group and bringing together a more all-embracing um, service model that will help people in many ways. And it's maybe not all library-centric, but you're still playing a role in it. I think I've always wanted to make a difference. Um, ideally, that's a good difference. I want to make things little better than I found them. Um, I think so far I've been pretty lucky and I've managed to do that. And I think probably the, the fourth word, if planning and collaboration and difference, making a difference are concepts, it's that I didn't want to ever stop caring. Um, I didn't want to be doing things just because they needed to be done. I didn't want to make a difference just for the sake of making a difference. I wanted to really deeply care about what difference was being made. And I'd like to think that I had planned my career. I hear about people with career paths and it's a mystery to me. When I look back at the stops along the way in my career, they just happened. I was in the right place at the right time with I guess something that was an appropriate skill set. And that goes all the way back to when I was in middle school or junior high and got my very first library job. 
when I was at IMLS and we were starting up the Laura Bush program, we found that an awful lot of people who were working in libraries, their first encounter had been because they worked at a library as a library page when they were in school. And that's where I began. I had no intent of going into library work. I got my bachelor's degree and my master's degree in art history. But I ended up working part-time in my local library. And then ultimately I ended up working full-time in my local library. And then ultimately after that, I ended up getting my degree and um, working in yet another public library on top of that. I would have not had any intention of leaving public librarianship. I loved it. You're, you're seeing on a daily basis the difference that you're making. You know you're helping people. Um, I also liked working with librarians. I think the people who work in libraries are some of the nicest, most committed workers out there. Um, Lord knows they're not doing it for the salary. They don't necessarily even get credit um, for what they're doing. A lot of it is done anonymously, but they do it because they believe in it. They are true public servants. And whether that public is actually on your campus or whether it's um, in an institution where you work in the library, you're doing it for that customer base. So I felt, I felt very much at home and I really liked working in my own hometown. But life happens and we moved. And when we moved, we moved to an area where I didn't have that same option. I was living in Delaware. I ended up finding a job in Maryland. In Maryland, instead of having 300 and some library directors, I was looking at 24 library directors because of the big, the big systems, the countywide systems. Um, in Delaware, it was a tiny state. We had three counties and every library had a director at that point in time. So I went to work at the State Library in Maryland and it was life-changing, absolutely life-changing because I got to see that bigger picture, do the strategizing, um, make the plans for what might make a difference, set the policies. Working at the State Library level was awesome. Um, I was lucky enough to become the Delaware State Librarian and I didn't do that for very long, although I was sorry to leave it because I knew that it was a job that had been a really good fit for me. I was close enough to see the impact of what I was doing and yet sitting high enough, and I don't mean elevated, I just mean to have a broad vision where I could see what difference a program would make as opposed to just an individual one-on-one -on -one service um, interaction. So I ended up with an opportunity to go to IMLS. Um, most of you know I was there for a decade. And that was also an awesome experience to be able to be at a level where there was actually funding to distribute, to try to help the states each tackle their own sets of problems and move ahead and increase that equity of access for everybody in their state. It may look very, very different in Florida, in Arizona, in Alaska, um, that was the wisdom of the plan back in the 1950s when they first started it. It was a very unique program and it was state-based. That was a phenomenal experience. I met people, um, I had a chance to travel, I had a chance to meet a lot of state librarians, got to see how if you've seen one, you've seen one, you haven't seen, you haven't seen them all by any means. Um, but then eight and a half years ago, I had a chance to go back to state librarianship. And I realized it was the job that I missed the most. Um, I had not had enough time in that position to feel that I really, really got to enjoy it as much as I wanted to. So I had this chance and I still believe it's the best state library in the nation. Sorry to my little friends out there, but I do feel that way. We do it all. Some libraries do the Talking Book and Braille Center. Some libraries have actual state library resource centers. Some libraries do library development. Um, we do do it all. We, we have a, a wonderful program and phenomenal staff. And I'm fortunate that uh, almost everybody who was there when I arrived is still there. Um, it's just a phenomenal group of people. So it didn't take me any time at all to decide I would go to New Jersey. Now, it took me a little longer to become even vaguely related to being a Jersey girl. You all know that the diversity, the 
the strength, the commitment, the talent, the dedication of all those librarians, all those really well-qualified librarians in New Jersey is phenomenal. And you don't walk in and you certainly don't try to tell them what to do. I think the hardest part was that I couldn't necessarily make them play with each other either. And that was, that was new for me. <laughs> but it was, it was an incredible honor to come in as the state librarian in New Jersey. I do feel like I've made a difference. Um, but I've also gotten to know some wonderful people who are making even greater difference in their own libraries. And it has been wonderful to be part of this community. I will stay involved and I will stay interested even in library construction, believe it or not, even though it's taken over my life for the last two and a half years and it was not planned for. <laughs> um, I've, it's, it's been an honor. I have been delighted to, to be among you to feel that I was one of you and to have developed friendships and very good collaborations. Um, when I look at the moment that we have at this point in time with Jen coming into the State Library, Juliet, Library Link NJ, um, moving on to, L to New Jersey Library Association and Suzanne coming from Cumberland County into LLNJ, you've got three people in leadership positions that are slightly new to them, although they were already leaders before, and they're coming in with, without the same history. Um, I won't call it baggage, but it's history that had an awful lot of territoriality going on at different points in time. And you've got some executive directors there coming in, ready to work together and to help make the state and its library network, library systems even stronger. And to me, that's what ends up benefiting the people of New Jersey. It's not just about benefiting the people in your own community, it's about benefiting even more broadly. And if there's a state library out there, if there's a state full of librarians out there that can do that, it is New Jersey. I certainly do not feel I have done anything on my own. Um, I've had phenomenal staff at the state library, an incredible management team. Um, but many people who aren't on that management team who just contribute so much every single day. I also am very aware that um, there's so many other people. I started to make a list and Michelle told me there was no way I could, I could possibly stop and thank everybody who needs to be thanked. But it's the county directors, it's the consortia directors, it's, the, it's the, all of those different people in the professional organizations. It's the partners that we've worked with through the other state agencies. It's the, it's the trustees. It's every single library director and every single library staff member who's out there. There are special groups of, of people who support the Talking Book and Braille Center. There are special groups that, that join us in working with our academic libraries, we're multi-type libraries. How do we cross over? How do we help school libraries? How do we help everybody? We have advisory groups that help the state library. And for anybody who's interested, you should make sure that the members of the management team and Jen know that you'd be interested in participating because this group, they do have an inside scoop. They do have an inside ear because they do have this opportunity for us to actually ask them really tough to ask directors of all of these different libraries questions for every single thing that comes up. But um, this is, these are groups, the LSTA Advisory Council, um, the Library Network Review Board, they're just, they're there, the statewide services group. Um, and we, we want to work with them. We want to get as much of an inside scoop as we can in order to be able to develop and deliver services that mean the most. We've also got groups of librarians who've come forward just because they work together on a project and they have become a voice. The people at Thomas Edison, how do I stop and thank both Dr. Pruitt who hired me and Dr. Hancock who's been so supportive. Um, there are just so many, I can't, I can't do them all. I won't even pretend to, um, they're probably the only two that are listed by name there, except I mentioned Michelle at the beginning. Oh, and I'll mention Bob Keith because he had to help me with my Zoom even today. Um, but everyone has just been awesome. So I think that's probably it for me. Um, 
if if there's somebody I haven't mentioned, if if I neglected to mention the center for the book or Vale or whatever, it's just because there's so many of you out there. And um, I'll always be grateful. And I hope that everybody will feel free to stay in touch with me. Um, there are staff members who will have personal contact information. If you need to reach out, please do. But I will not step on Jen's toes. Um, she gets to do what she has to do. So that's it for me. And that's all I'm going to say about me. I think Michelle gave me 10 to 15 minutes and that's what I used. So at this point in time, I'm going to get to bring us on to the real attraction today. I am delighted to have the chance to introduce to you Eric Kleinenberg. I had the opportunity to hear Eric speak at the 2019 ALA conference. I was so taken with and so inspired by his remarks that having him present here in New Jersey kind of rose to the top of my list. I had my keynote speaker wish list and he was right there. We had him lined up for the um, library trustee event that did not end up happening this fall. And so bless Michelle's heart. Um, she is owed an extra special thank you. She and the other members of the state library management team that this gets to be my farewell party. Um, doing a retirement in the time of COVID, uh, a little different event than it would be normally. But when I stopped to think about it, I might have opted to do this anyway, instead of a party party. So let me introduce Eric. Eric Kleinberg is a professor of sociology and the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, where he explores topics such as urban development, climate change, and culture and media. He's the author of several books, including Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life, and Heat Wave, A Social Autopsy, Disaster in Chicago. He also co-authored, along with Aziz Asari, the number one New York Times bestseller, Modern Romance. Eric's scholarly work has been published in journals, including the American Sociological Review, and he has contributed to publications such as The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Rolling Stone, and This American Life. Eric, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Mary, and hello to everybody. Mary, that was such a librarian speech you just gave. I think we're all here to thank you, and you wound up thanking everybody else. Um, so let me be the first to say uh, what an honor it is to be part of this celebration and uh, how kind of disappointed I am, I guess, that we can't do it in person where we all would like to be right now. And I really hope that we um, have a chance to um, celebrate in person sometime or uh, Jen to have future meetings sometime, uh, you know, with uh, people who need to come together and talk about uh, why library, libraries matter and how they do. And I have to think that um, before too long, we're gonna get to a point where we're able to meet in, in person and not just on our screens. Uh, but anyway, it would be um, a mistake to start without saying, Mary, thank you for your work and for your public service. Um, and it'd be fun to hear what you have planned for your next act. And we'll, maybe we'll get to talk about that later. I guess I wanted to start my remarks today by um, bringing us all back to that moment uh, in March of this past year where we got this um, advisory from the, um, from the World Health Organization that came through all of our, our states saying, um, you know, we need to uh, get through the pandemic. And the way that we're going to do it is by being socially distant. Um, we can, so, social distancing was the big idea um, that health agencies gave us for how we survive. And I, I heard that concept. And I guess I, I understood uh, what they were talking about. I understood why social distancing uh, seemed like it was the right move. Um, but immediately when I heard the idea, I, I thought, this is a big mistake. This is, this is social distancing. It's actually a really bad idea for right now. It, social distancing, it's this idea like if we're going to survive the pandemic, the thing you need to do is, you know, get inside your house, lock your door. Uh, make sure that you and people in your household are going to be okay, get what you need, and just hunker down until this thing ends. Um, and 
uh, you know, don't don't really worry about the rest of things. You know, don't worry about the rest of of, of society. Um, and I knew that that was a really bad idea because if you think about it, you know, what makes someone vulnerable during a period where there's an infectious disease pandemic, it's not social distance. It's not whether you're engaged with people in your life. It's not whether you're you know socially close to people. You're you know checking in on each other, providing support how you can. It's physical proximity, right? It's it's physical proximity is the danger, right? Physical proximity is you, you know, you sneeze on someone, you cough on someone, you breathe the same air. You, we, what we needed to survive the, the COVID pandemic, I realized, was, was physical distance and not social distance, social solidarity. We needed physical distance and social solidarity. We needed social connections because in crises, I think we're learning, we need each other like never before. We, we learn how much our fate is tied to the fate of the people around us, right? If you live in a society where you have um, strong social solidarity and that's reflected in say your employment law, uh, maybe you have protections for workers. So, you know, you know that if, if you're sick, you don't have to worry about losing pay if you have to skip work or you don't have to worry about getting fired uh, if you can't get to work as so many Americans do. Um, you stay home and you protect yourself, but you protect everybody else too. But if you live in a society like ours where worker protections are really weak, what happens is lots and lots of people who work in say restaurants um, go to work anyway when they're sick because they know that there's a risk of losing their jobs. And so they show up at work and then they make everybody else, including the customers, much more at risk. Or if you live in a society that doesn't do public education all that well, then what happens is when there's a, a, a pandemic brewing, people can't understand the difference between a novel and potentially lethal coronavirus and the ordinary flu. And so when their kids are sick or when they're sick, they go to school anyway, or they say, well, I don't need to wear a mask. I heard the president say it's, you know, it's just the flu. And, and that's really a failure of society to be socially close, right? It's social solidarity gets us good worker employment you know, rules. It gets us good schools. It means that we deliver groceries and pharmaceutical goods to older people around who uh, can't go out and get them for themselves during a pandemic, right? It means we teach older people tech skills. It, it means we provide all kinds of services and support, even if we have to do it at a physical distance, right? Social solidarity, physical distance. That's that's That was the secret, right? We got the concept wrong. And I was thinking about that a lot in part because in a previous disaster years ago, I'm sure you guys all remember Superstorm Sandy or Hurricane Sandy that that hit New Jersey so hard. And uh, when that happened, I actually was um, doing a lot of work at the time on cities and climate and doing a lot of writing. And uh, I, I, after the disaster, uh, President Obama, uh, his administration reached out to me and asked me if I'd be the research director for a big uh, project they called Rebuild by Design, which involved uh, setting aside a couple billion dollars of federal money to rebuild the region uh, that was affected uh, by by the disaster. And they wanted to think about how you build 21st century infrastructure that was going to be adequate for all the threats that we're, we're, we're now facing, not just building back what we had before. And it was an amazing competition, an amazing opportunity for me personally to get to be the research director here. I got to work with these teams. So there were 150 teams of engineers and architects and landscape architects and city planners that applied uh, to be part of the competition. There were 10 finalists and my job was, we had a nine month period to take these teams around New Jersey and New York and talk to them about the different needs and vulnerabilities and possibilities in the region. And they actually had nine months of, of research and then kind of outreach with um, different stakeholders and different communities and then participatory design before we had to bring their, their, their projects before a jury. And it was a really high pressure situation because uh, all these teams potentially had you know, the ability to get hundreds of millions of dollars to build a big system or infrastructure project or structure uh, that was going to be on the map, you know, in, in New York and New Jersey. So high profile federal project, a lot of intense competition and um, the teams were nervous. And, and I, I always remember this one day I was talking to this group, uh, a, a team of extraordinary designers. They had done all this amazing work 
uh, in the Gulf Coast after Katrina. And they came to me and they said, Eric, you know, we've really been struggling to figure out a design idea that's exciting enough for this competition, but we finally landed on something. You know, we have this idea for something that we're calling a resilience center. And I said, wow, you know, resilience center, that sounds really interesting. Can you, can you tell me about it? And they said, uh, yes, um, we have this idea for a, a, a building. It's like a prototype of a building. We're going to put it in a town. Uh, and then the idea is that it's scalable. Like we could, we could put them in neighborhoods everywhere. We could put them in towns everywhere, cities everywhere. It could be in the U.S. It could be around the world. And, you know, resilience, that's a kind of a big buzzword in the world these days, especially for people who are working on climate issues. Now, probably in the pandemic, it'll become a, a buzzword as well. Like we want to help groups build, bounce back. And their idea was it, a resilience center should be a place that's like a home away from home for everybody who lives in a community. It's a place where everybody who's there feels welcome. And they said, you know, we want to build this building that's going to, um, it's going to signal to everybody it's welcome, but it's welcoming because it's going to have rooms that are, are programmed to do all kinds of different things. So kind of a variety of different uh, things you could do in the rooms in this building. They said the Resilience Center, it's going to be staffed by these, uh, you know, resilience professionals uh, whose job was to be like aggressively welcoming, you know, that, to keep the doors open, make sure everybody in the area knew that they were welcome in the, in the Resilience Center. They said it's gonna be a home away from home for people. Um, you know, they want people to be comfortable there all the time so that if there's a crisis, they know they can really go there and get support. And they said, look, you know, we, we want everyone in the neighborhood here, but realistically, it's very young people and very old people um, who are gonna come the most because they're most rooted in the neighborhood. And they said, you know, we, we realize we have to do things to draw them here. So for younger people, imagine if we had like story hour in the morning and if we had sing-alongs and, you know, maybe, you know, we could do some like craft things and different game, you know, different games for them. And they said, also, we know that the young people are not just going to come to the Resilience Center by themselves. They are going to have uh, adults with them, you know, caretakers, parents, grandparents, nannies. And so for them, like we probably need to have some comfortable furniture, Maybe we could have Wi-Fi access. We could have, you know, some periodicals around, maybe some machines, uh, make sure that the kind of middle-aged people or, and caretakers are feeling good too. And then for the older people in the community, let's make sure that we have, um, uh, you know, current events conversations, you know, movie nights. We could have, you know, conversations about politics and local issues and culture of different groups in the area. And they were so excited about this proposal and they came to me and they said, Eric, you know, we think this is going to be a winning idea. Um, we're so excited about the Resilience Center. What do you think? And, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor. Uh, I teach at NYU. I've been teaching for about 20 years. And so I get proposals and ideas from people who've been working hard for a long time. And I know that the, the answer is always to say in those situations, uh, wow, that's a really great uh, uh, thing you've done. I, I recognize all the work that's gone into this. And, and I said that to them. Uh, and then, and then I paused for a minute and I said, um, you know, by the way, uh, have you ever heard of a library? Uh, and, and, and it was like frustrating for me, I guess. Part of me was frustrated. I thought like, of course, the, the, they've just reinvented the wheel here. They've just kind of come up with a design for something that basically works like a library. It was frustrating, but I also realized, I guess I understood where they're coming from because, you know, we live in this world where there are so many people um, who have failed to recognize just how many things the library does today in our cities and our communities and our towns and our suburbs, um, how the library has evolved to be so relevant. You know, all the functions that the library has taken uh, on to be not just a place where you go for books and, and you know this, uh, but to be what I've come to think of as a vital social infrastructure. And that, that's the concept I use, you know, social infrastructure. I write about this in Palaces for the People. When I say it, I, I, I mean, there is an infrastructure for social life that is just as real as the infrastructure we have for power and for water and for transit and for communications. And we don't think of it as infrastructure um, because we don't talk about it that way, but that's what it is. So, so by social infrastructure, I mean the physical places and the organizations that shape our capacity to interact with each other, you know, to engage each other uh, in real life. And I, I, I've come to discover that 
when we invest in social infrastructure, when we design it well, uh, when we build it well, when we maintain it, um, when we program it even, um, especially when we program it, uh, you know, we get all kinds of returns. You know, we get all kinds of benefits. Um, and, uh, and, and, and people who live in a place with really strong social infrastructure just have an easier time uh, getting to know one another, providing support to one another, working out their differences face to face, you know, dealing with community problems when they come up, whether it's something mundane um, or something life or death like a hurricane or a pandemic. But I also know, and, and I, I know this from my research, but also because I, I grew up in Chicago in the 1970s and 80s, and Chicago had invested a lot of money and a lot of resources into building social infrastructure, you know, in the 50s and 60s, uh, and, and even before in the New Deal, parks and playgrounds and libraries and schoolyards, athletic facilities. Um, but then in the, the age of austerity that kicked in in the 70s, uh, and eighties, Chicago stopped spending money on those things. They just started to fall apart. Like the libraries weren't updated. Um, the, you know, the librarians, uh, hours were cut. The library open hours were cut. Playgrounds were falling apart. And so when I grew up in Chicago in the, in the seventies and eighties, it's like we had built this social infrastructure, but we neglected it. And then people stopped using it or it wasn't even accessible. You couldn't get in the door. So in a situation like that, people become all the more likely to just kind of hunker down. Um, and 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 get atomized, uh, get estranged from one another, and I knew that that was a real uh, you know problem as well. And so um, you know what I what I said to the to the group on on that day is, look, I understand um, you think this is innovation, um, but sometimes sometimes the thing to do that's really bold and exciting and that helps a society make it through the next crisis is to look a little more closely at some of the resources you have before you and that maybe you haven't appreciated and maintained and repaired and renovated and updated uh, for their current state uh, and, and do something exciting with those things as well. I, I, I have come to believe in the time that I have uh, been under trying to study social infrastructure that there is no social infrastructure greater and more significant than the library. It is an amazing uh, institution, especially in the United States, where we have this unique set of, of local libraries, you know, in, in our neighborhoods, in our towns, in our suburbs, um, that are accessible, that are open to everyone, regardless of your race or your ethnicity or your social class, even regardless of your citizenship status. You don't need to be a citizen to use a library. After all, you just need to be here. Uh, they, they are generous. Um, they, they stand for the idea that everyone who's here has a right to access our shared cultural heritage and they provide it. And we see that in, in ordinary times, but we've, we've even seen it during the pandemic. If you think about all the things that you have done to make sure people in your communities have access to digital uh, books and periodicals or, or films uh, you know, expanded access greatly, or to make sure people have Zoom classes that they can do, places to have conversations with each other, or to make sure people have Wi-Fi access because you blast it out of your library so people can go outside of them, even if they don't have the ability to work remotely or go to school remotely at home. Um, Drop-off services, curbside pickups, I think of all the amazing things that libraries have done to get us through this pandemic. Um, let me tell you something, they, we would not have gotten here if we had taken the suggestion of the economist who wrote that article in Forbes magazine a few years ago and knocked down all the libraries in this country and replaced them with Amazon stores, <laughs> which was definitely uh, a pitch on the table, right? I mean, Amazon saw the pandemic as an amazing opportunity to make more money than ever before, right? And Jeff Bezos is even far more rich than he was before this thing started. I mean, imagine uh, seeing the pandemic as an opportunity for profiteering. And, and libraries and library leaders like Mary, and I know like many of you as well, saw this as an opportunity to help. An opportunity to help. Opportunity is even the wrong word. It was a, a moment that, that called upon us and called upon you to do that work. And so I want to end by saying, you know, my, my book is about libraries as places and social infrastructures. 
But you know better than anyone uh, that libraries work not only because they are places, but also because they are peopled. They're peopled uh, and they're staffed by uh, magical creatures called librarians, uh, you know, who do extraordinary work. And one of the main uh, reasons that libraries do as much as they do, um, probably to be honest, far more than they should do because we've come to depend on libraries to fill in all the gaps that are open in the other parts of our society, right? We don't take care of homeless people. We don't take care of mentally ill people. We don't take care of young children. We don't get, take care of very old people. We don't take care of unemployed people. And they all wind up in the library. Um, and, and so you find yourselves overworked. You find your uh, facilities uh, overused um, because we haven't done enough in other areas. So um, I, I, I wanna honor Mary uh, by honoring and thanking all of you uh, for what you've done collectively. And I hope as we enter a new day in American society and American history, uh, that there's help on the way and that you will continue to be able to do all the extraordinary things that you do in the library system of New Jersey, uh, but also uh, that you'll have more of a helping hand than you've had these last several years. So I'm going to stop there. And Mary, I wonder whether you could come back and join me in conversation for a little while. Absolutely. I've been sitting here writing notes. <laughs> I know I'd heard some of it before, but um, yeah, Eric, that was that was awesome. I, I really hope that I hope that everybody else becomes as big a fan as I am. Um, I remember walking out of your program and thinking, now if we could just clone him in ah. every community who would speak up, you have no you have no vested interest other than the vested interest of any library user. Um, I think that's the thing that, that, from my perspective, that's the thing that we lack is we don't always have um, an unbiased, just good-willed advocate who will speak up and say, this is one of the most important social infrastructure things that we have in our community. How could we neglect it? You know, Mary, it's so, it's so funny because you know how you, you I know a lot of you have these, um, like families and kids who are in the library all the time. They're just like library people and they're always there and they grow up in the library and you watch them, you know, grow and develop. And, you know, the, you, you know, those kinds of people I'm talking about, they're just like library patrons from the get-go. Okay. I was not that kind of guy. I want to be clear. Like I, I did not grow up in a library. I did not fully understand all the things that libraries do. And then that started to change when I had kids and I realized there are all these things that you could do in yeah. libraries that you couldn't yeah. do. Uh, in other places and that I could take my kids there and every time they asked me for something in the library, I could say yes, you know, which is <laughs> no. yes. a four star store where, you know, you, you, every, you, if you say yes to things, you walk out with a thousand dollar bill. Um, and um, there was just something very generous about the libraries uh, that I hadn't fully understood before. I be, and so the things I say about the library, I'm not saying because like I'm, I'm out to be an advocate because you know I'm out to promote the profession of librarianism or librarianship. I, I say it because I'm a social scientist and I wanna understand you know, how civil society works and how communities work and what kind of institutions you know, pr promote the best in us. And honestly, Mary, uh, you can't do better than the library. Um, uh, on all those registers, it's just something I found, and I, I found what's obvious to all of you every day. And if I can be helpful as uh, a spokesperson now by just telling people what I learned, I'm happy to do it. Well, that's that's terrific, and I, I'm just I'm aware that um, on one hand, I would never want to see the library go away. I mean, libraries have reinvented themselves so many times. The people back in the 90s saying, what are libraries gonna do? You know, now the computer's gonna come in. What are, you, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna go away. And it's like, you know, the card catalog was a technology too. We're talking about something that is centuries and centuries old. It's about connecting people to information, to each other, to their culture, to each other's culture. And 
I believe that philosophically the institution will continue to exist. But when you were talking about the resilience centers, I thought, you know, if these people came up with this idea and said, this is what it needs to look like. If we just gone around and changed the names on our building to library slash resilience center, there probably would have been a pipeline of new funding coming in. But because we cling to our traditions, sometimes we may be um, hurting ourselves. You, you know, the, I, I think that's true, but I, I just wanna give you a little more credit than that because, um, you know, if you had asked me 30 years ago, which public institution was going to be best able to uh, evolve and innovate and keep up with all the challenges of digital technology um, and the new ways that people live with, you know, their mobile devices and uh, their kind of uh, extraordinary hunger for new content. Um, I might not have said the public library was going to be the most, you know, able to do it. But if you look at a library and the things that libraries do today and compare it to what libraries are doing 30 years ago, it's a really different scene. Yes. And so I think, you know, one of the reasons that, um, uh, you know, I've been speaking to a lot of library uh, advocates and groups in the last couple of years is because I, I, I think that you actually have changed in your practice but what has to change also is the narrative that you tell uh, to others, you know, yes. including policymakers and including constituents. There's still too many people who just don't understand. They don't know all the things that, that libraries do. And that's a real problem for, uh, you know, for funding and for community support. Um, one of the reasons that I you know, like to call places like libraries social infrastructure is because you know, we're actually pretty eager to spend money and public money on infrastructure. You know, we, we all value infrastructure and we value infrastructure, whether we're, you know, on the right or on the left or somewhere in the vast middle ground. Like we recognize that if you want to live in a modern successful society, infrastructure is essential. And uh, if we think of the library, as some people do, as kind of like this nice luxury that you can, you know, provide for people who are interested in reading books, um, you're really missing out on what libraries actually do uh, for communities today. And if you reframe it as social infrastructure and, and provide an account for all the ways they work as gathering places. Um, I mean, like, could I, could I ask you to do this thought experiment? I can't remember if I, I think I did this at the ALA too. Like, it, you know, it, try this, try this thought experiment for a minute. Imagine that the library did not exist. Okay. Im imagine that there's no such thing as, there's no such thing as a library. We're all here for your retirement party from Amazon today. And, um, uh, With my nice retirement package. <laughs> you would be much wealthier than you are right now, Mary. Exactly. <laughs> um, but imagine that there's no such thing as a library. And I came to you and I pitched the idea of the library and we decided to go to the governor of New Jersey, who I think is a pretty, you know, well-meaning, you know, guy who likes public programs. And, and, and we said to uh, the governor, we said, hey, Mr. Governor, um, we, we've been on a great Zoom call today and we've got a great idea for you. We're, we want you to uh, invent this thing called the library. And um, you, we want to build a library in every suburb in every town in every neighborhood of every city in new jersey and you know we want to have like some big ones in the you know in the big cities that are really grand and spectacular but mostly we want them to just be like kind of you know scaled to the size of the community um they should be um uh open six or seven days a week uh they should be staffed by these uh public employees called librarians um uh they should be open to everyone you know, regardless of age, race, citizenship, et cetera. Um, they should be stocked with uh, uh, books and periodicals and all kinds of, you know, resources that people can use. Um, they should have Wi-Fi, they should have computers, they should have tablets, they should do uh, all kinds of convenings and events and special classes. Um, uh, uh, they should respect the privacy of everyone who comes in there and the dignity of everyone who comes in there. Um, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter if you, uh, you know, need help. Um, oh, and one last thing, uh, Mr. Governor, uh, all of this should be free for everyone who comes in. 
um, and people can take whatever they want out of the library and we'll just use an honor system to make sure they bring it back. Okay, so imagine we went and pitched this to the governor today, we pitched this idea. Uh, raise your hand if you're on the Zoom call, if you think the governor would say, that sounds like an amazing idea. Yes, we're definitely gonna do that in New Jersey. <laughs> Let's just wait for the answers to come in. I'm gonna see how many hands get raised here. I, I mean, I, I'm willing to bet that very few people are raising their hand. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if they're not raising their hand, the reason is because that idea that I just pitched is probably like the most radical idea that's been pitched on Zoom this year. You know, it's, it's like a hugely radical idea that I just described what the library should be. And the, and the mind-bendingly crazy thing is, Mary, we have it. Like we, we have, <laughs> we, we, there's this, cra this wild mind-bending idea that seems completely out of touch with reality. And we actually built it, not just in New Jersey, but throughout the country. And it raises the question of, you know, how did that happen? And what do we have to do to get back to a place where we could do it again? Well, and, and when, when I pictured, I really did picture us on that visit. Um, I can see the governor who I agree is well-intended, well-meaning, could hear the idea and think it'd be wonderful. But the response would probably be, gosh, in this budget year, there's no way we can do that. That's too expensive to initiate. Even when you say, we already have those places. We already have them staffed. Maybe they could be staffed even better, maybe whatever. We already have them. I don't, I don't, in our individual communities, we all struggle to get the money we need to keep things up. And we already have the basis. I'm not saying it can't be done. I just, I, what I'm saying is you're absolutely right. We ought to be able to build this argument get a whole core of advocates out there who aren't librarians, who don't have any vested interest in the survival. You, you make me think of um, a story I heard at one point in time, and you're mentioning Chicago, having been born in Chicago and grown up in the Midwest, resonates with me, that there was a, I believe it was a woman who might have been the librarian in Chicago, but her point early on was, or maybe she was a commissioner um, or on the board, something, was that they needed to realize that they could not go in and say, the library needs anything. They couldn't really even go in and say, the people who use the library need something and we need money for this in order to be able to provide this for our library users. They had to put it in terms of recognizing that the library is in the business of that community. And if you were trying to get something for the Chicago Library, Chicago Public Library to meet the needs of the people who use that library, you needed to frame it in terms of Chicago needs this. And this is the place where it, where it comes from. And of course, her story was very cute. You know, that Chicago was in the Chicago business and those lucky people in Champaign were in the Champaign business. Right. Um, but I mean, it's right. We do have to put what it is that we feel would benefit the people in our community in terms of if our particular community is gonna be as good as it should be, if the people are gonna get what they need, then this is what we need for the community, not for us. I think that's right. And I also think we should recognize that we are in this kind of unique historical moment where in a way everything is up for grabs. Um, we're probably going to see public investment in this country on a scale that we haven't seen since the New Deal in the coming years because we have to figure out a way to stimulate the economy again coming out of the pandemic. And I think there's, ten, you know, there's tens of millions of Americans who are out of jobs, uh, many of whom are in New Jersey and it, more in New York. Uh, and I think that we can expect there to be uh, this weird combination of both um, economic anxiety and kind of scarcity at the local level, like there, there's a real crisis, a fiscal crisis for states right now, but also there might be infusions of resources that come from federal programs that you know, create opportunities to do things like build new infrastructure or update current infrastructure and expand programming. I mean, the, the New Deal was this incredible moment for building you know, uh, all kinds of cultural resources and physical places that remain uh, among the gems of American life today. And I think there will be a comparable push to do uh, extraordinary things like that in coming years. And it's gonna be, you know, I think 
the, the, my point is simply that if you're in the library community, uh, you know, we need to have our heads up and, and we need to be looking for possibilities uh, you know, to, to make ex exciting pitches. And whether that's the language of, you know, uh, employment uh, or democracy uh, or culture uh, or equity or business um, is an open question. Uh, but we need to, I think, you know, the library as a collective project needs to be defended and promoted. Well, and, and I would, I would suggest that New Jersey is actually in a, in a pretty good position um, when it comes to some of those pieces. We currently have a construction bond program. We don't have an ongoing program. Um, and Jennifer is coming from a state that does. So we're hoping that she'll be a, a good voice to help bolster an initiative to get an ongoing program. But there will be some buzz around at least 38 new projects. And if that can build some momentum, I think, I think that, would be, that would be excellent. Um, I, I think another piece that you touched on there that, well, I, I don't wanna lose the other thing that I think is really strong for New Jersey right now. And that is the relationship that we have built with the Department of Labor and Workforce Development. And as people need jobs, there was a major initiative um, over like the past three years with career centers in libraries for people to go in and learn how to do their resume better, um, look for jobs, look for where they could get new skills. So we have a very good partnership and collaborative effort there that could be revitalized and really bring us into this conversation. Great. I, I think that one of the things that a lot of us felt very disheartened about during the, the early stages of the pandemic was that we were really in a position of being forced to close because people couldn't, couldn't calculate and keep the physical distances. And it was very difficult. They weren't even allowed to be doing the curbside delivery. We, couldn't, we didn't know where this, how this was being passed on. There was so little information about whether if somebody brought back a book and somebody else picked it up, they could have infected themselves. Um, so we found that our libraries couldn't do a lot of the things that they normally do do to what, whatever your wonderful phrases were around um, culture, companionship, um, all those things that you get by being in a library, in the space. And they really reinvented a lot of what they had to do in order to do it remotely. Um, whether it was additional programming, PJ story times, whatever it was, book clubs where there weren't book clubs before. Um, great young adult book club for our um, talking book and braille center. I mean, lots of things that, that rose up. People were thinking they were reinventing. And this is one of those cases where 10 years from now, we'll look back and say, boy, did we jumpstart progress and innovation during the pandemic because we had to reinvent ourselves and there was no turning back after we'd yeah. done it. So anyway, that was not a comment. It wasn't a question. It was me blathering a lot. <laughs> You're entitled. Well, um, I wonder if I actually had a question here for you that I was supposed to ask. I, I had written some down. I don't, I don't know, Eric. I think we've probably got some coming in from the group and maybe, um, maybe we should go to the group instead of what I had written. I'm looking at Bob and Andrea. Do we have questions? All these new faces. You as well. <laughs> um, so we do have a number of questions that came in. Um, they generally, uh, there's you know, a couple of overarching topics that they all fall under. Um, one topic that I think is summed up by Juliet Matchy uh, really well, she says, thanks, Eric, and thank you, Mary. Eric, our challenge in library land is effectively communicating our value. What can we do that we are not doing to create that awareness and appreciation of libraries, especially at decision tables? I, I mean, Look, I, I really hope my book is a resource for you, I should say. I mean, the, the, you know, I, I've done a lot of writing. Uh, both the, the book is the kind of longer form argument, but I, you know, I've done these op-eds in the New York Times about the, the role of libraries in, in a democracy. I, you know, I wrote about libraries as, as polling places, right, for drop-off ballots. Back, remember when we were worried that people weren't going to be able to vote uh, because of the Postal Service? Um, and what a fight that turned out to be and how important it was that so many libraries around the country were places where people could register to vote or to actually vote. Uh, and, um, you know, I wrote about libraries as social infrastructure and civic hubs. And so um, in a way like the, 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 
uh, you know, I'm not a political strategist, uh, unfortunately, but um, I, I do try to offer uh, ideas and concepts and arguments that I would encourage you to, to pick up if you find them useful and take them to your, uh, you know, your local political meetings or to your constituents. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's really a strong case to be made um, for the value of the library as something much that's much more than what people ordinarily think. And, you know, so again, I'm probably people here who are much better at doing politics than I am, and I don't want to give you strategy. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what I think, I'm, I'm, I hope that you find the ideas I'm offering you useful. So another question um, from Dan Weiss. If you were building or renovating, um, if you were building or renovating a new library this year or next, what kinds of things would you be thinking about given general future trends, the pandemic and the changing role of libraries in general? In your opinion, what are the crucial issues to keep in mind for planning and building? Great, so great question. I guess, for, you know, first is access. Um, you know, where is a library located and is it serving people who, you know, really need it, need a library most? Uh, can you get into the building, which means, you know, is it physically accessible to people of all abilities? Uh, is it open? Uh, you know, the, our, our library, our librarians, uh, you know, employed often enough that the library doors can be open? Is it open on the weekends when a lot of people need to go? Is it open later at night, you know, to, for people who work during the day? Those are really big questions. And that's probably not what you're thinking about when you ask the question, but I just want to remind you that those things are really significant. I mean, look, in the world we live in right now, libraries are getting used for all kinds of things that they weren't originally designed for. And rather than try to push back and tell people that they should be quiet and read a book, I think it would behoove libraries to do what, you know, they've done in Helsinki or Calgary or Austin, Texas, you know, these amazing new libraries that have come up in the last few years, which is, turn your library into a, a, a gathering place and a civic hub, emphasize the um, resources for young people and for older people, um, you know, make sure that you've got great bathrooms that are spacious. Some, some libraries have showers, you know, they have like places for people who are gonna use the library that way. Um, and they're set up in a way that that doesn't, you know, like the libraries where I spent a lot of time in New York City in the branches, if a person goes in the library, into the library, goes into the bathroom, they have an individual bathroom and you, you know, people will be there for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and everybody gets angry. Like the, the design of the bathroom has to be different. And that's not what we're here to talk about, I know, but in, it kind of is, you know, you, you have to figure out how to deal with that situation. Like in, in the Helsinki library, which if you haven't seen, you need to go online and look at it. It's called the Udi library, um, you know, right downtown, this incredible place. They have this kind of giant basement with a huge, you know, huge rooms that are dedicated to bathrooms. And what it means is like, you know, there's like individual places you go inside of a collective space. So you can, everyone can always find a toilet. Everyone can always go and wash your hands. Uh, you know, some people can use a shower. It's, it's, I, I can't tell you what a difference this makes in the life of a library because it means like that get, stuff gets managed, right? So you could pretend it's not real, but it is. And then I think obviously like you wanna have, uh, you know, terrific technology so that people can um, uh, get online however they wanna get online. Um, you know, you can have flexible spaces that can be adapted to different uses depending on, you know, what's happening. Don't, don't lock in a specific use for a room, um, tr you know, try to be flexible. Um, and, um, you know, I think like, uh, honor what your community is interested in. Like, you know, listen, listen to listen to what people in your community want as you start to make decisions about um, how to how to program things. And um, uh, you know, I think it's always important if you're going to build something that you listen to the users first. You know, figure out what 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 people who are in the community want and need as opposed to kind of like hiring some brilliant architecture firm that comes in off a spaceship and designs something that's beautiful and awesome, you know? Um, and and I, I would suggest, Eric, if I can just chime in yeah. there, I, I think I'm thinking back to your earlier comment about how libraries are doing maybe more than they should because they're taking in 
taking on the care of services that aren't being provided elsewhere. And it may very well be that instead of holding firm, well, you know, this is what we need for our libraries, our libraries are about culture, they're about information, they're about connecting people, to be able to go to the powers that be in your community and say, you know, we need to, to do something about our library, we need to make it better. But talk to us about what functions you see us having to do by default. Do we need a crowd bathroom? Do we need, what facilities are we gonna need in order to meet what the governance folks think we're gonna to have to be providing? And I think we don't necessarily go in and ask that question in advance. We tend to build what we wanna build and then try to adapt our spaces to meet these extra um, customer uses. Well, well said, yeah. Well, I wanna, if, if, if they don't have another question burning on their lips at this moment, I have one I'd like to just kind of toss in here that it came from your book. And it, it's, it's one of these things, when I, for me, I, I love the palaces for the people, but the part of your title that chokes me up every time I see it is how we can help fight inequality, polarization and the decline of civic life. I mean, I can't even say it without getting a little lumpy in the throat. Um, I just, I really feel that is what we do. Um, I was caught by this, there's a very small section that I remember seeing it in, in the book, where you talk about the internet and how it fosters polarization. Um, how it really can bring groups apart, bring them apart as opposed to bring them together. Would you just talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's there's this question about whether we really need places like libraries now because social media are social infrastructure is the argument from the tech people. Like, like in the end of the book, in the conclusion, I write about Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. from Facebook. And Mark Zuckerberg says, you know, Facebook is the social infrastructure for the 21st century. And, and you know, the way that he promotes the company, it says, like, <laughs> you should come to Facebook if what you want is meaningful social interaction. <laughs> if you want meaningful community life, Facebook is your, should be your first stop. And, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, it just makes my stomach turn. Um, you know, I mean, uh, it, you know, like it's always very convenient when, when, when there's like a big social problem and you say like, the way to solve your, this social problem is to uh, use my product. You know, you should always be suspicious. A huge exception for book authors, by the way. Right, 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 right. It's totally, totally, I do not qualify for that. <laughs> that is, if you want to solve your problems, you should read my book. Read my book. Uh, buy them for everybody. Uh, no, just, just kidding. Um, but I think, um, you know, we are, we are really deeply polarized. I mean, we are a seriously divided country. Uh, you know, and if you didn't believe it before January 6th, you probably believe it a little bit more now. Um, but everybody believed it before January 6th. I mean, we've been living inside of this hellscape for the last, you know, several years. Um, and it's really brutal. And, you know, we, we, we're kind of failing to take each other's humanity seriously. Um, we're failing to think about the preciousness of life and our kind of individual and collective vulnerability um, you know, we've gamified everything, um, including, you know, what it means to injure uh, and have an insurrection. Um, and I think that part of that is that we're so accustomed to treating other people like bubbles on a screen. And if we're engaging bubbles on a screen, it's just easier to be awful uh, and to say, you know, hurtful, terrible things. And for the argument to get from zero to sixty in about a second, uh, and it probably you know I'm I'm on Twitter by the way like I you know I'm I am I'm a, a hardcore Twitter user I like you know I, I have fun there I do a lot of library tweets you know I'm I'm like a I it's a it's I'm I'm not a luddite on this stuff you know I recognize that Twitter's part of the public you know part of the public sphere and a lot of the conversation happens there so I I hope to see you all on Twitter. Um, but I don't think we're going to solve our big problems of polarization and division on Twitter. You know, I think we're going to kill each other there. Um, and I think if we have any chance of dealing with the divisions we're confronting today, it's going to be because we find a way to engage each other in real life, you know, face to face. 
in places like parks and athletic fields and playgrounds and libraries, you know, places where we're going to encounter people in their full humanity. And it's just, it's much harder to say the kind of things that people say to each other on social media when you're sitting across the table from them. Um, and, uh, you know, I have seen communities where people are really different come together and, and kind of come to at least recognize their humanity, which is not a great, but it's a start. Um, and I kind of feel like what we need to do now is figure out how to restart. And so, you know, in the book, I write a little bit about my experiences as a, a parent of a really, you know, dedicated soccer player. And I, you know, I spend my weekends on these soccer fields with people who are really different from, from my family and um, who often have very different views uh, on the world. I've had a few choice conversations with New Jersey soccer parents, uh, you know, who are their own breed of, of uh, human. And, um, you know, uh, Bob, Bob's been there, I could tell. And, and you know, uh, it's, but, but, and I will disagree with people I talk to, but, you know, I can also smile and laugh with them and find some humor. And, and it's just, and, and, and I have relationships that I would never have were it not for the fact that we share a space together uh, every weekend. And I know there are relationships like that that start in libraries, you know, when parents are with each other at story time or in a current events or book group together, like you just learn about each other's experiences. And so the nature of our disagreements uh, is becomes more civil and we don't feel like we need to kill and defeat and, and destroy everyone. And so I'm not, it's, I'm not glib, Mary, about the situation. It's not like I think, oh, if we wanna solve the deep problems in America, we just have to spend more time in the library. It's not gonna be that easy. But I do think if we were trying to repair civil society, uh, there's probably no better place to start than the library. Thank you, and 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 I and I think you clarified quite well there. We can't we can't always find the time to spend time with the people with whom we may disagree. But it's it does escalate very quickly when you're just exchanging words online in a whole different way. Bob, Andrea, did you have anything else waiting there? Well, it's 3.15, or actually a little after 3.15, um, and I forget what Michelle's... Um, At 3.15, Michelle was going to was gonna line us up, but her, her clock's five minutes slow, so... <laughs> <laughs> I hope she's still at her desk. Um, well, while, while we wait for her to come back, um, let's take out one final question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, my God, so much pressure. Yeah, well, this is a really? question. Bob, it's so uh, much pressure on you, man. You got to pick the right question. Like, <laughs> the right question. I'm just going to pick mess this up, Bob. This is very easy. <laughs> because really, like, if you think about it, what we're all going to be, th you know, we're all going to walk away from this remembering the last question. And <laughs> was it really the right question? Was um, it so, so but in that case, I suggest you read Eileen's question. It just came in. Eileen, wow. <laughs> jump in the Eileen, line. Huh? Way to call somebody out, Andy. Okay. Oh Palmer says, as a profession, we are coming to grips with our own failings in creating welcoming and inclusive spaces for all, and our own complicity in failing to address systemic racism. How important do you think it is for us to acknowledge this as we work to be the place in the community where conversations around these topics can happen? I mean, we have a lot to answer for uh, as a country and, and in our communities. I mean, we have talked a big game about democracy and equity uh, and inclusion and opportunity. Uh, and, and I think we all know in our hearts that we have not pulled it off and that uh, this country faces a crisis of racial inequality and discrimination um, that you, know, you can say abstractly, but you can also live it on a daily basis when you think about how your institutions operate. And so I think we have an opportunity to come out of this, you know, presidency and pandemic in, in a new place um, and to recommit ourselves to uh, taking old problems more seriously. And, uh, you know, I've never seen a political leadership so explicitly committed to the cause of racial justice as this one is the, you know, the, the, it feels like we're in a, we're just in a different moment um, and there's a reckoning um, that is not just about police departments, it's about all features of American society. And, you know, libraries are a part of that. And I think every library should be asking, you know, do we treat people differently on the basis of race? Is, is our system, you know, helping to deal with the problems of in, inequity 
uh, in the state. Uh, you know, so like which which libraries get resources and which don't at the state level, and then inside of your library, like how, which patrons are treated like they belong and which are treated like they don't belong, and and why and, and what can we do? So uh, absolutely, I think. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I still feel inspired by that poem from yesterday, you know, the, I mean, I just keep watching it over and over again. Um, it, it, we, we have a beautiful vision and a beautiful ideal and we have a lot to live up to. Thank you. Thanks to Eileen for the question and thank you for the answer, Eric. That was, that was excellent. I, I know Michelle's going to wrap us up here, but but um, before she does, I um, thank you. This has been such an honor. I, I couldn't have planned for myself a better um, farewell party here. Uh, and I hope the people on the call got as much out of it and enjoyed it as much as I did. I'd like that to be my farewell gift to them. So thank you again for making time for us. And I did hear you say to Michelle before that you'd make something happen with the trustees later too, so. <laughs> thank you, Mary. It's really been an honor to be part of this celebration. What, Mary, before you go, can you tell us what you're gonna do next? Well, I have an awful lot of stuff to unpack. I still live in Delaware part-time. Okay. So all of the stuff that's in my apartment in New Jersey, I figure the whole month of February will be spent unpacking boxes and trying to integrate it into the household. My husband's very nervous. He feels we only have so many windows for so many plants. Um, and that's just the beginning of my collection. So that's where it's gonna start. We have always been travelers. So looking at retirement and going, I bet South Africa is not gonna be on the list this year. Are we gonna get back to Italy? Um, it's probably gonna be more domestic travel. And obviously we will we will wait a little bit, but we were lucky enough to do some before, so maybe I'll be sorting pictures. <laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. Thank, thank you both. You. Eric, as we wrap this up, I just want to say thank you again uh, for making this possible for us. Um, it was really very generous of you. We're really grateful to have you on, and I was delighted that Mary was able to have this chat with you as her retirement party. Uh, so really, we're very, very appreciative. And from the comments that I've read, um, people really enjoyed the conversation. I could tell they didn't end up in the Q&A. They were in the chat box, a lot of them. And so I think what you had to say resonated uh, so well with many people. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. And your whole team for making this happen. <laughs> we worked with the whole team to thank get you here. So we really appreciate it. And then I would, uh, Mary, if, you know, I want you to say some final words, but I also want to take note um, and thank everybody that joined you today. And, you know, I know you probably didn't see the entire list yet, but you'll have a chance to look it over. And not only did we have a very strong New Jersey contingent um, as expected, but you had all of your friends from across the country here <laughs> Uh, online. I saw many familiar names. And so uh, I think that speaks to you um, so well as um, a leader, as someone who's been in the field uh, for a, a long time, that you still have all of these people who care about you and who showed up today. So thank you to everyone who was on uh, this final webinar for Mary. And Mary, I'll just turn it over to you for some last remarks. Okay, well, I, I will echo what Michelle said. I, I thank you, my, my friends um, from way back. I mean, I've got people who knew me back when I had the part-time jobs on here. So um, that's, a, that's a, a good feeling to feel like uh, there are people throughout my career and that my career hasn't gone so far astray from where it started that we've lost connections. I have, I have loved being here in New Jersey. I think that uh, Enough people have heard me say that, even as we went through construction, you guys, and we did, we went through this together. Um, and I know that Jen will lead you forward also, and it will be good. Um, just thank you. I hope that many of you will stay in touch with me. Um, there will be people at work who will have contact information for me. I will not meddle in Jen's business. Um, however, I would love to hear from many of you, um, any of you who, up to reach out to me. So thank you for joining us today. If you know that there were people who could not join, 
as Bob noted, we did record this. Um, I'm going to have a chance to look back through the comments because I really couldn't in real time. And I just I thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. It means a tremendous amount. So I'll let you go. I won't keep you any longer. Um, Want to make sure that we end on time, if not before. And thanks so much.